Good afternoon, everybody. A very warm welcome to today's UCL Lunch Hour Lecture. It is my great pleasure to introduce S.E. Wieding, Professor of Developmental Psychopathology in the UCL Division of Psychology and Language Sciences. Professor Wieding's lecture for us today is entitled, Why Do Some People Become Psychopaths? Welcome. Thank you, Jacob. Um, Individuals with psychopathy tend to capture public imagination. People are fascinated by what makes these individuals so different. And there has been a tendency to, um, at times, sensationalize uh, the condition and the description of the condition uh, in the media. And I guess one of the um, signs that these individuals really do capture the public imagination is that they have featured in a number of uh, popular films. So uh, here we have a picture of Joker, a character from Batman films, and he's a very impulsive character, and he's also entirely unconcerned about the impact of his behavior on other people, and he seems to lack empathy. Uh, we have Kevin, who is from the movie. We need to talk about Kevin. This is a very chilling description of a child who's not capable of forming attachment relationships with his parents, who's cruel to animals and cruel, cruel to uh, younger children, and who ends up, uh, by the end of the uh, film and the book that it's uh, based on, uh, becoming a killer. He kills family members and also people uh, at his school. We have uh, Anton Chico, who's an absolutely chilling contract uh, killer in the Coen Brothers film, No Country for Old Men. And if anyone has seen the film, I think one of the very scary things about observing this character uh, is when you see shots that are focused directly at his eyes, and there really is no emotion coming back at you from those eyes. And then there's probably everyone's uh, favorite psychopath from movies, uh, Hannibal Lecter from the Silence of the Lamb film. And uh, he is, uh, again, a very good exemplar of a psychopathic character in that he's entirely void of empathy for other people, and he's also extremely skillful at manipulating other people to his uh, own ends. And in fact, if you ask uh, members of the general public what springs to mind uh, when they hear the word psychopath, people often think about serial killers. Um, and real life serial killers uh, include characters, characters such as Ted Bundy, um, who uh, killed at least 30 women in America in 1970s. He was very bright and uh, extremely handsome, and he often posed as somebody who was in a position of authority or someone who was very reliable to entice these women to come with him, and then he uh, murdered them in a very cruel way. And uh, people think that he actually may have committed many more crimes than he confessed to. His uh, description of his, himself was that he's the most cold-hearted son of a bitch you'll ever likely to meet. And interestingly, his defense lawyer didn't uh, have a lot of good things to say about him either, and said that um, <laughs> he was the very definition of heartless evil. So this is a man who was able to be very charming, was able to convince other people to come with him, but who actually turned out to be somebody who felt absolutely nothing for his victims and didn't seem to really feel any guilt for what he had uh, done. But of course, not all psychopaths are serial killers. In fact, only very few are. So what are the characteristics that define an individual with psychopathy? Well, one of the most prominent characteristics is their lack of remorse and guilt. So they simply do not feel bad about the things they have done. They may sometimes say that they do if they perceive that as uh, getting them something that they want, such as early release from prison, but it's very clear from the way they behave um, that they do not actually uh, experience um, remorse for what they have done. They don't feel bad about, about what they have done. They have very shallow affect. Their emotions appear uh, ingenuine and are often very short-lived. They don't form typical attachment relationships. Uh, they don't look after the people um, around them. They can often have superficial charm, so if you meet these individuals for the first time, uh, you may be very, very alert by them. They may seem very gregarious, 
very charming, very nice. Uh, but once you get to know them for a longer period of time, that charm tends to uh, wear off. They often have a grandiose sense of self-worth. They think they are better and more deserving than other people. They're pathological liars. And they are typically very good at manipulating other people to their own ends. As a developmental psychologist, I am very interested in how these characteristics develop. It's unlikely that anybody is born a psychopath, but clearly you don't get this sort of condition as a birthday present when you turn 18 either. So the research in our group has been focused on investigating what makes some children developmentally vulnerable to developing these sorts of personality traits as an adult. And you can focus on various different levels of query when you try and understand the development of this condition. Um, so we, we can look at how children uh, who are at risk for becoming adult psychopaths look like behaviorally, what differentiates these children from typically developing children or other children who may have behavioral problems but who don't exhibit these core characteristics of lack of empathy and guilt. We can study how these children see the world around them, so we can use experimental tasks to focus on the uh, psychological level of analysis, and we can see if these children's brains react differently to information around them, which is what you would expect if their uh, behavior and if their um, way of processing information uh, is different. And you can also use genetically informative designs to study the relative importance of genetic and environmental factors in developing this type of condition. And you can also try and look for specific risk genes and risk environmental factors that in concert might promote the development of the disorder. Now, I will first tell you a little bit about what makes these children behaviorally different from their typically developing peers, but also from other children who have behavioral problems. So there are several early behavioral warning signs of children who are at risk for psychopathy. And these look very different from the kinds of characteristics we see in adult psychopaths. The person who first formally downward extended this psychopathic criteria to children was Paul Frick. And this was work that started 20 years ago in the United States. And now several different research groups across the globe have studied these behavioral characteristics uh, in children and in young people. These children lack remorse and guilt, so they don't express that they're sorry for what they've done. They lack empathy, and this can be often manifest by them behaving cruelly amongst other children, bullying, being very physically aggressive in a way that is really showing no concern over the well-being of the other person. They are sometimes also cruel to animals, such as pets in the family. They have shallow affect, so many of the parents report that they don't feel like they can connect with this child. They may have a perfectly nice relationship with their other children. And if anyone has read the book, we need to talk about Kevin. I think that's a very good example of a mother who was able to form an attachment relationship with one of her children, but really felt like there was nothing coming back from uh, the, the child who went on to develop um, psychopathy. These children can manipulate other people for their own gain. And they have a sense of being more important and more deserving than other people. And in combination, this constellation of traits in children is called callous and emotional traits. So clearly we don't want to label children as psychopaths. But this constellation of traits gives you a warning sign that a child who scores very high on these traits may be at risk for developing psychopathy in the adulthood. They kind of like the warning side. You, you want to start thinking about doing something to help this child if they display this constellation of characteristics. There's now quite a bit of good longitudinal research showing that these sorts of traits are predictive of persistent, violent and severe antisocial behavior and psychopathy in adolescence and adulthood. They don't predict that every child who scores high on these sorts of traits will inevitably become an antisocial adult, but they do index that that child it as, is at a significantly increased risk of developing um, the antisocial presentation in adulthood. Antisocial behavior in children is called uh, conduct problems. 
And if you think about this uh, circle that I'm showing to you as representing all the children with conduct problems, and the blue circles as representing the minority who also has high levels of callous and emotional traits, um, you get an idea that they are a minority, but they are a sizable minority. So people estimate that somewhere between 25 to as high as 50% of the children who are diagnosed with conduct problems also have this presentation of high callous and emotional traits. And what sets them apart from other children with conduct problems is that they often engage in proactive or planned acts of aggression. So whilst the aggression in other children with conduct problems is typically quite impulsive, and in reaction to something external that happened, for instance, a perceived threat or slight to the child, these children can engage in aggression if they think it's going to get them something they want. It might get them status among peers, it might get them some goods that they desire. As I've already said, they lack guilt, they don't worry about hurting other people to get what they want, and they often have low levels of anxiety. And this is in contrast with the remainder of children with conduct problems who have low levels of callous and emotional traits and who often aggress when they feel under, under threat and whose aggression is often impulsive, it's not premeditated. And when these children have had a chance to reflect on what they have done, they actually often feel bad and guilty about having hurt other people or having done something that has caused their parents or their teachers to feel sad. And this presentation can also occur with high levels of anxiety. So you're already beginning to see from this behavioral data that the reactivity, emotional reactivity profile of these two types of children with conduct problems in, is quite different. You have a group that seems to be more cold and calculated and unempathic, and then you have another group who seems to be more hot-headed, reactive and impulsive, but who also, also has the capacity to empathize with other people. So these differing behavioral profiles have got uh, psychologists interested in, in how these children may see the world around them differently from typically developing children, but also their peers with conduct problems. And we can focus on the study of the psychological level of analysis by giving uh, children experimental tasks, which we often present on a computer, for instance, and, and these tasks can give us an idea of how they process information such as facial emotional expressions. So I want you to have a go at doing one of the tasks that we do with the children. Here's a face that is starting with a neutral, rather calm expression. And I'm going to press a button and it's going to start slowly um, developing an emotional expression. And when you think you know what the expression is, please shout it out loud. And don't be shy. Happy, very good. So you can see fairly early on in the development of this expression that this is somebody who is looking happy. The corners of the mouth are going upwards. You can see a display of teeth. This is a happy looking chap. And here's the same chap pulling a different expression. And again, shout out when you think you know um, what emotion this person is displaying. Scared. So I'm hearing people say scared. So this is somebody who is fearful. And you can see that this person is scared because they are showing a lot of eye whites. This is one of the very, very ecologically valid signs uh, that somebody is scared when their eyes are looking a little bit large and you can see a lot of the eye, eye whites. Now, children who have conduct problems and high levels of callous and emotional traits have difficulty in recognizing and reacting to other people's emotions, particularly emotions of distress such as fear um, and also sadness, which is what you see here at the top uh, right hand side, uh, sorry, bottom right hand side. And people have used uh, facial stimuli such as what I just showed to you to assess this, but people have also used stimuli that is auditory, so people doing vocalizations that are emotional or body postures. Um, and this work by our lab and, and, and labs of our colleagues have very conclusively shown that these children really do not appear to process other people's emotions in a typical fashion. They seem to be underreactive to these displays of emotions and unable to recognize them as effectively as typically developing children do. 
interestingly, they also report feeling less fear themselves. And one of the things that we're interested in researching in our lab at the moment is whether the reason they have such difficulty in processing other people's emotions stems from the fact that they don't feel those same emotions very strongly themselves. So it's probably trickier to empathize with other people and to recognize their emotions if you have an impoverished experience of those same emotions yourself. We also know from standard learning paradigms that these individuals who have conduct problems and high callous and emotional traits are less responsive to punishment. <laughs> so when you have to learn about which stimuli is good to go for and gives you points and which stimuli is bad to go for and doesn't give you points, these individuals are typically poorer at modulating their behavior in response to the punishment cues. And People have theorized that one of, the way, one of the reasons why these children may be tricky to socialize is that two very powerful tools of socialization are not as effective for them. So anyone who has small children in the audience or has dealt with small children knows that uh, when they misbehave, we often give them sanctions. So in my house at the moment with the three-year-old, we have a naughty step and he sits there relatively regularly. Um, so. It's something that I employ in my house. It's very effective. He doesn't like sitting on the naughty step. He said he'll, he'll kind of improve his behavior and he usually comes and joins us and he indeed does improve his behavior because he doesn't like being excluded from the activities. Um, we also do empathy induction. So anyone who's dealt with toddlers has basically repeated, well, think how Johnny's going to feel if you whack him with the toy car until they blew in the face. So we try and get the children to focus on how their behavior might impact somebody else and somebody else's emotions. Now, if you are really incapable of feeling perhaps those emotions yourself and also feeling for other people, and if you don't react very much to punishments, there are two very powerful socialization tools that are not going to be as effective in bringing you up as they are in uh, typically developing children. So really what we see in these children is this diminished emotional responsivity um, to both uh, kind of more material punishments but also uh, in terms of their reactivity to other people. And this profile is in contrast with the profile we see for children who have conduct problems but who have low levels of callous and emotional traits. These children, if anything, seem to be a bit emotionally overreactive. They have what psychologists call a hostile attribution bias. So they tend to see threat in even stimuli that typical individuals don't perceive threatening. So they might see an ambiguous face and think that this is somebody who's trying to get at me, so I'm going to aggress first. So in this group, what we see really is increased emotional reactivity, at least to some types of stimuli. And these data have got ourselves and also other groups interested in looking at how these children's brains look like when we show them uh, emotionally charged stimuli. One of the ways um, in which we can study how the brain processes information is by scanning children using functional magnetic resonance imaging. Um, this is a non-invasive technique that involves uh, scanning the children's brains as they lie inside the uh, magnet and they do tasks that we have set to them. We can then look at their brain activity as they are doing the tasks and this gives us an idea of what parts of the brain are engaged uh, in processing um, the information that we show them. Uh, one of the brain areas that researchers uh, on conduct disorder have, uh, or conduct problems have uh, focused on is called uh, the amygdala. And this is a very small uh, almond-shaped part of the brain. It's a very preserved structure, uh, even reptiles have it. Uh, it's there for basically alerting you that there's something salient in the environment that you ought to pay attention to. And this salient information for us human beings uh, includes emotions of other people. And studies of children with conduct problems uh, using emotional stimuli have been a little bit mixed. Some studies have reported increased amygdala reactivity to emotional stimuli. Other studies have reported decreased amygdala reactivity to emotional stimuli. And our group recently wanted to investigate whether it's the callous and emotional traits that determine whether the children's
brains are under-responsive or the amygdalas are under-responsive to emotional stimuli um, or over-responsive to the same stimuli. So we have carried out a range of paradigms recently. I will talk about two here in the talk. Um, and uh, here is an example of a recent task that we've used called masked fear task. And in this task, we presented either fearful faces, which are on the left-hand side there, or calm faces, which are on the right-hand side there, for a very short duration, only 17 milliseconds. And then we replaced those faces with a calm face of a different uh, identi identity. And the replacement of the face happened so quickly that the participants are not consciously aware that they've seen a fearful face. So the advantage of this task is that we can look at very early pre-conscious processing of emotion. In other words, we get an idea of how automatically the brain attunes to the emotional uh, stimuli. And when we contrast the fear and the calm conditions, we find a pattern of res brain responses where children who have conduct problems and high callous and emotional traits show very low amygdala reactivity to these pre-consciously presented fear stimuli. The typical children are somewhere in the middle and the children with conduct problems uh, and low callous and emotional traits show, if anything, overreactivity um, to these uh, fear phases that we present pre-attentively. And here I'm showing you uh, a plot of the data from the children with conduct problems alone. And on the left-hand side, on the y-axis, you can see the uh, brain activity estimates um, from the um, fMRI analysis. And on the right-hand side, you can see the child's uh, callous and emotional trait score. And you can see that the higher the callous and emotional trait score, the lower the amygdala response to these fearful faces. We've also used uh, more complex emotional stars, tasks, such as a uh, task that uh, showed scenarios of other people in distress. So this was a cartoon task where the children uh, saw a scenario where the mother is reading a newspaper, a child is going down a slide, and the child ends up hurting uh, himself and falling off the child. And then the person inside the scanner gets two choices uh, as to what is the appropriate ending to the task. And most children, even the children with conduct problems are very able to say that the appropriate response is for the adult to go and comfort the child. So behaviorally, the children beha um, process this task very similarly. But interestingly, again, the amygdala of the children with conduct problems, particularly those children with conduct problems and callous and emotional traits, is less reactive uh, to observing other people in distress in this very complex social scenario. And the kind of contrast we're given in a scanner is we have a similar scenarios, but without the emotional content. So we can really extract the uh, emotional response of the brain. So the data from these behavioral, psychological and brain imaging studies is really um, showing this picture of shallow affect and lack of empathy and demonstrating it in different levels of analysis. So we know from naturalistic behavioral settings, from more experimental behavioral settings, and also from brain imaging settings that these children really seem to have this underreactivity to other people's uh, emotions, perhaps particularly distress. So these sort of data uh, obviously begs the question as to why do these children process the information around them so differently? Are they genetically at risk for being this way? Are there some environmental risk factors that mean um, that they come to be very unempathic, very emotionally underreactive? And one of the ways in which you can uh, probe the origins or the etiology of any given trait or disorder is by classical twin design. And the twin design relies on a comparison between identical or monozygotic twins and non-identical or dizygotic twins. The identical twins are a result of a single fertilized egg splitting. So they are, for all intents and purposes, each other's genetic clones. And an example I often use here, I run the research group uh, with Dr. Eamon McCrory, who's an identical twin. And his brother has three children. But if they did a paternity test, they couldn't tell whether it is the brother or whether it's Eamon, who's the father. So these, these are two individuals who have identical DNA. Then we have non-identical or dicycotic twins who are the product of two separate eggs 
being fertilized by two separate sperm. So they are like any other sibling pair, but they have been born at the same time, which makes them a good comparison in the studies for the identical twins. And you can use the twin studies to infer the relative important of, importance of genetic and environmental influences on variation on any given trait. And the way you can do it is you can compare how similar do these clones look to each other on any given behavior and how similar do these non-identical twins look to each other on any given behavior. And you can conclude that there is more than likely to be genetic influence on a trait if the identical twins look more similar to each other than the non-identical twins. So if genetics are important in driving similarity, then the individuals who share 100% of their DNA should look more similar to each other than individuals who share on average 50% of their DNA. You can also conclude that there may be environmental factors that make family members similar to each other if the non-identical twins uh, correlate with each other or resemble each other more than the half of the uh, identical twin resemblance. So if you think that only genetics are important for driving similarity, then the dicycotic twin resemblance should be exactly half of the uh, identical twin resemblance. Now, if the dicycotic twin resemblance is actually larger than half the identical twin resemblance, this tells us that there are some environmental factors that act over and above genetic factors to promote similarity between family members. And we can also infer that there are some individual specific or non-shared environmental factors if the identical twins are not 100% identical on a trait. So these are each other's genetic clones to the extent that they differ on any given feature. There must have been some environmental influences that differed between the twins. And an example I often use to drive this point home is if you imagine a identical twin who grew up in Britain versus an identical twin who went to live in Australia, you would expect that there are changes and differences in pigmentation between these twins because one of them is exposed to constant sun and the other one has to deal with the kind of weather that we've been having last week. So this is environmental factor that differed between the twins and drives um, differences between family members. And we have used the twin design uh, to ask whether there are differences in the relative importance of genetic and environmental factors for the development of conduct problems in children who have high callous and emotional traits and in children who have low callous and emotional traits. And I've been uh, fortunate to work with a very big twin registry that is headed by Robert Plomin at the Institute of Psychiatry here in London. And what we were able to do, because this was a very large twin sample, is to select those children who are in the top 10% for conduct problems for the twin sample. So they are scoring in an atypical range for conduct problem. And then we divided this extreme group to two. We took those children where either one or two members of the twin pair also scored in the top 10% for callous and emotional traits. And then we looked at children where neither member of the twin pair scored in the top range for callous and emotional traits. And within each of these groups, we were able to compare the identical and non-identical twins to give us an indication of how heritable are the conduct problems for children who have callous and emotional traits and how heritable are conduct problems for children who have low levels of callous and emotional traits. And what we found was that for children who had high callous and emotional traits, the conduct problems were strongly heritable, whereas for children who had low levels of callous and emotional traits, environmental influences, both shared and non-shared, were more important for the development of conduct problems. Now, that doesn't mean that the children who have high callous and emotional traits are somehow genetically destined to become antisocial, um, but it does mean that they probably have more of a vulnerability, innate vulnerability for developing conduct problems. Similarly, it doesn't mean that the children who have low levels of callous and emotional traits have no genetic risk whatsoever but it may be that, that that takes different form and may require some environmental factors uh, to express or more environmental factors that you may need uh, to express this vulnerability um, if you have high callous and emotional traits. Of course, the twin studies only give us an idea of the relative importance of genetic and environmental factors and they don't tell us what the actual genes are or the actual environments. 
And currently, there is very scarce data about the actual genes and actual environments, particularly for children with high callous and emotional traits. So ourselves and uh, other people have speculated that the risk genes for high uh, callous and emotional traits and low callous and emotional traits type antisocial behavior may be different. And this would be in line with the fact that the other group is associated with low emotional reactivity, whereas the other one is associated with high emotional reactivity. So in a way, you would expect there to be different vulnerability genes for the two groups. Perhaps uh, genes that confer low emotional reactivity and arousal in the case of children with high callous and emotional traits. And there's certainly some data to support that this may be the case. Um, so a, a genotype called serotonin transport of molymorphism has been associated with um, uh, callous and emotional traits. And the allele, or the, the type of that genotype that was associated, was the one that confers lower emotional reactivity. We know that from um, imaging genetic studies. But this is just a single study. Interestingly, this genotype only conferred risk in children who lived in low resource neighborhoods. So it suggests that you may have propensity to lack emotional reactivity or lack empathy, but whether that expresses itself as callous and emotional traits or not may depend on your environmental conditions. There are also some uh, studies that have uh, suggested that genes that may be associated with uh, attachment processes could be important, such as the oxytocin receptor gene. But ultimately, there haven't really been replications of these findings. We have ourselves condu conducted a genome-wide association study, which means that we combed through the whole genome, looking whether there is anything that crops up, and there really weren't any big hits. Um, and there hasn't been a robust replication of either our study or any of the other studies. So it's very early days, but if this particular phenotype goes in line with what we know from other behavioral phenotypes, and I have no reason to expect that it would be different, we likely uh, to be spending a long time looking for those genes. They are going to be small genes that probably, sorry, genes of small effect size that probabilistically increase the risk for developing this sort of behavioral outcome. And it is more than likely that any of these genotypes will require the presence of other risk genes and environmental risk factors um, in order to penetrate as a risk um, phenotype. Again, ourselves and others have proposed that for those with low callous and emotional traits, we might be interested in looking for genes that confer high arousal and reactive aggression. And again, there's some, there's some tentative data suggesting that these sorts of gene types may be associated with the uh, low callous and emotional type of antisocial behavior. And gene environment interaction may be particularly uh, important uh, with regard uh, to this subtype. So there are a number of good studies suggesting that if you have a polymorphism of monoamine oxidase uh, A gene that confers increased emotional reactivity, and if on top of that you experience maltreatment, then you are at a substantially increased risk for developing conduct problems. But very, very early days, and all of these studies need more replications, and we probably need to really wait for a lot of methodological developments before we can reliably start finding uh, genes associated with this condition. Similarly, the risk environments may differ for the two conditions. So we have reasonably good data for the low callous unemotional traits subgroup. Uh, it's reliably associated with harsh and inconsistent parenting and maltreatment, but we have less of an idea of what are environmental risk factors that promote development of callous and emotional traits. And our own work using uh, identical twin differences design where we rely on the fact that these are each other's clones and any differences in phenotype in response to uh, uh, environmental factors such as parenting um, should be um, kind of, we can reliably say that that's environmental. Using that sort of methodology, we haven't been able to show that harsh and inconsistent parenting, for instance, predicts increase in callous and emotional traits. So that doesn't seem to be uh, something that impacts um, the development of those traits, or at least not as reliably as it does for the children who have low callous and emotional traits. There's some very interesting early data. This is a funny looking graph with lots of little data points, but I will talk you through it. Um, Paul Frick and his colleagues looked at the relationship between 
harsh and inconsistent parenting and conduct problems. And when you look at children who have conduct problems and low callous and emotional traits, you can see this dose-response relationship. The higher the frequency of high and inconsistent parenting, uh, the higher the level of conduct problems for these children. But in contrast, children who have conduct problems and low levels of callous and emotional traits appear to have high levels of conduct problems regardless of whether they receive less or more of the harsh and inconsistent parenting. Now this is not to say that environmental influences don't matter for these children at all. And in fact, there is some very uh, interesting new work showing that, for instance, parental warmth is associated with lower levels of callous and emotional traits. So these children may be responsive to some positive environmental influences. Uh, there have also been treatment studies that have shown that some parent -focused, parenting focused interventions can be effective in reducing callous and emotional traits and conduct problems. And there is a recent uh, uh, study showing that if you add empathy training to normal parent training programs, children who have high levels of conduct, uh, callous and emotional traits may particularly benefit from this sort of training, at least when it's done uh, with children who are at the preschool, early primary school age range. So some evidence that there are protective environmental factors that can be very helpful for these children. So why do some people become psychopaths? I'm afraid um, that we have only taken baby steps so far in terms of research. So we have some inclination, but we really don't have a good idea of uh, the developmental trajectory, uh, particularly at different levels of analysis. So there's indication that these children may be more genetically vulnerable, but I hasten to add, not genetically destined for this sort of outcome. Um, it may be that they lack environmental buffers or they have some risk environmental factors, which we yet don't know what they are that mean that the genetic vulnerability expresses itself as callous and emotional traits. And we know that they um, are not very emotionally reactive, uh, empathetic, they're insensitive to punishment. And this sort of presentation at the cognitive emotional level is probably going to make them more resistant to typical socialization uh, efforts. But we also know from longitudinal studies that not all children who have conduct problems and high callous and emotional traits grow up to be adults with psychopathy. So we really do need more longitudinal studies that combine different methodologies and will um, enable us to really study what are the environmental risk factors? How may they be different at different time points? How do they influence uh, development of these children's cognitions um, and um, affect processing? So how does the atypical emotionality develop over time? Um, it's interesting to find out, and this is something that we are, we are studying at the moment in our group, is whether these children can empathize under any circumstances. So if we focus their attention differently, or if we use stimuli that they themselves report as, say, sadness or fear-inducing, do we then see an emotional response? And if we do, can that be harnessed to teach them a bit more about how to empathize with other people? So can we help to see them to see the world differently? I think that's a kind of an important research question for the next 10, 20, 30 years. Um, I know that there are specific interventions being developed that really focus on the difficulties that these children um, experience. And I'm sure that there will be a lot of crosstalk between these interventions and the basic science research. So some of our basic science findings will feed into how these interventions are tailored more specifically to meet the needs of these children. And of course, there is the hope that eventually there will be very few of the individuals who develop psychopathy as an adult outcome. And I want to finish by uh, very much acknowledging all the people who are working in our team at the moment and who've worked in our team in the past. This sort of research requires a lot of theoretical knowledge, technical skills, statistical skills, and uh, first and foremost, a lot of people skills in uh, in when we recruit the samples or when we um, test the children. And we have a, a very capable team of uh, people um, who um, are involved in the research. And I particularly want to acknowledge Eamon McCrory, who's there at the center with me, who co-directs the um, uh, research group with me. 
and also want to acknowledge the people who have very generously funded our research. And I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you. And I should also mention that you can go to our lab's website and there will be information about our research and materials in that website. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have time for one question. Oh, sorry. Anybody has a good question? It has to be the very best question that can be asked. Um, if a high um, callous and unemotional traits are genetic, that would suggest that maybe one or both of the parents also share some of those traits. Yep. So could that be an environmental factor leading to yep. uh, so that's, an, so that's an excellent question. So the question was that if these traits uh, are heritable and one or two of the parents share the traits, does that mean that the child is uh, more likely to be um, exposed to environmental risk? In short, uh, yes. It's a phenomenon that we call gene environment correlation, which is that the parents parent according to that uh, genotype that they pass on to their children. So the child kind of has the double whammy of having genetic vulnerability, and then perhaps, perhaps having a parent who is not really able to provide the optimal parenting environment um, either. There is some interesting data suggesting that that may not always be the case. So there's data from a colleague of mine in Australia, Mark Dad, that has looked at how the children and the parents engage with each other. And interestingly, at least in the case of the mothers, the mothers of these children try and look for eye contact, try and engage the children just in the same way as any typical mothers do, but the children themselves don't engage in the same way. So they don't look the mothers in the eyes. They don't kind of um, give back in the same way. So whilst I'm, I'm sure that you're right that there are a number of times where the environment is also impoverished because of the parents' vulnerability, it's not always the case. And sometimes these kind of attachment difficulties may be driven by the child and the very difficult temperament that the child has. Thank you very much. Will you join me in thanking Professor Wieding again for an excellent lecture? <laughs>